you shouldn't really change a lot of what you're doing simply because we're not a lot around each other. What we should do is turn on our cameras, have our daily stand up, go through the exact same 15 minutes you would normally have. You might structure your your planning meeting slightly differently. You might use team lives event if you have a really big sprint review that needs lots of people. But the rituals don't change. The fundamentals of Agile and Scrum do not change. What you need to use is technology to the best of your abilities to make sure that you can do the exact same things you've always done. So I mean, teams that I've worked on remote, we dial in the person on the phone or we would get them on a Teams meeting or Skype back then. I think we were using Skype for business back then, but none of the rules actually changed for us. And I think when you're remote, things like DevOps actually helps you a lot, right? Because you don't have to be next to someone when you have a fully automated pipeline that's gonna do a lot of that heavy lifting for you. It makes being remote even easier because everything is automated for me. Abel, you have anything to add? Yeah, I'm super lucky because I've spent most of my career working remote. That's I don't true. know how that turned out, but it's, it's just been that way. And it's been great. And like you said, having teams or, you know, back when I was doing this a lot, Skype for business or whatever, that really worked. Even things, little things like turn on your camera. That has made a world of difference because I've always been, when we used to do those uh, uh, stand-ups and, and we'd have all of our rituals, I would call in through Skype, but we would never turn on our cameras. And I did feel that disconnect. But since COVID happened, we've been requiring, at least within our teams, we've been requiring everyone to turn on the cameras. And that has made a world of difference. So when we have our stand-ups, when we do have our meetings, I, I actually feel very connected with the people talking. Yeah, you're forced to engage, right? When your camera's off, I can tell you right now, if my camera was off, I'd probably be looking at the PowerShell code <laughs> the studio that's on the right that's teasing me right now. I would probably be checking some email right now, right? I, I have, you have these distractions, but when the camera's on, you almost feel obligated to be engaged, right? And as a manager, and I've called, I've called Abel out on this too, because we all have multiple monitors. So I have monitors up here, I have five total. And when I'm peeking, you can tell, right? Cause like Donovan's clearly not paying attention because he's like looking up over here in the right. And I'm like, oh, I am Abel in the back. Hey, Abel, I need you to pay attention, right? And, well, and I've been busted so many times. <laughs> <laughs> so I know where your monitor should be. Um, it's really funny. So I think the answer to your question is, don't use COVID as an excuse to not do the right things when it comes to Agile and DevOps, right? <laughs> See it as an opportunity to leverage technology even more than you have in the past to make sure that your team still stays efficient. I think Agile and DevOps really become even more important when we are forced to be distanced like this, right? We need to have these type of rituals in order to move smoothly. Yeah, very nice, very nice. So, so that means Microsoft uh, like encourage everybody to turn on the, the webcam, right? Uh, we have on in our organization. Now, someone says my camera should be on. You can see me, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so they, they're the ones who can't see me. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure my camera was on. I'm talking all this. Turn on your camera and might have the <laughs> <laughs> No, but my camera's definitely on. Um, so on our team and advocacy in particular, we have been really encouraging people to do that because we've been a remote team almost from the beginning, right? I've always, I've been teasing people like, man, I've been practicing for this, right? Since I bought my house in 2000, I think it was three, maybe? I think it was uh, three. Yeah, I've, I've, I've always worked from this office, right? I mean, I've always been a remote employee. So to me, it's been kind of natural uh, to do this. So it's very important. Yeah. OK, then basically, uh, there is another question I have, and that is could be connected on the way how you work together. So since you know each other as colleagues and as friends for over two, two decades, um, what do you think? Um, I'm first, people don't think you're separated. I mean. If you wouldn't look differently, you would think you come only as a twin pack. So, <laughs> uh, so um, and the question is, what do you think makes a great colleague to work with? Oh, that's that's awesome. Like we joke that I, sometimes we feel like Scotty Pippen and, and Michael Jordan together, right? Like that like neither one of them won a championship without the other one, right? It takes both of those people to do it. And I think the reason that Abel and I get along is that we're exact opposites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, in almost every way, like historically, when we were talking about if we were in high school, there's no way we would have been friends, like never on earth would we have been friends Fighting all the time. Exactly. But the thing is, is that we had these common threads. We both like money <laughs> to be very, very <laughs> trist. We both like software and we're both attracted to women. Like so like that was like those three things like that was it. Like we, we have these three things in common. And code was the thing that was in the center of all that, right? Like we just love writing software. And I'm very aggressive in your face, very A-typing. Like I'm, I, I get really passionate. Enable's very chill and laid back. 
But when we talk about code, it's like we get each other, right? So I think it was just having that that something that you all find in common, right? Some something that you share. And when you share a passion like software, like, like what else do you need? Like you just need a passion that you share and software is that passion that we shared. And since the day we met, like literally we met, uh, we were, we had a common mentor who brought us to the same company. And that's where Abel and I've met. And we've been friends since 2000, I think, 99 or 2000. I can't remember exactly. 2000, because my son was, my two, son was three years old. Two years three old. Three years old. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yep. And I bought my car the year after that was 2001. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we've known each other for 20 years, which is just amazing. So it's 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 having that shared. And I think also having someone who challenges you, right, which which has been very valuable for me. When I, when I built, like you were playing the video of the league. Uh, the video is awesome. I love that video that we did at Build. But if you'll notice, when I hired those people, I was told, Donovan, go hire a team of Donovan Browns. And I knew what they were. It was flattering, but I knew what they meant. But that's not what you want. Like, you don't want five Donovans. What you need are four people around Donovan that make Donovan better than he would be on his own. I don't need five people who know what I know. I already know what I know. What I need are people who know what I don't know. So I hired Abel, who has a completely different background and different experiences, but a common understanding of DevOps. I hired Damian Brady. Again, we understood DevOps, but the way he came about it and the companies that he worked for were drastically different from me. I hired mm -hmm. Stephen Morosky because he's an infrastructure guy. He knows DSC and PowerShell. Matter of fact, he and I have a meeting on the books right now to go talk about PowerShell when I'm done with this because he knows it to a level that I hope to know one day. And then we got Jessica Dean, who is just... Kubernetes, open source, Linux. I know none of that stuff or didn't when I when I hired her. So to me, it was about building a team and surrounding yourself with people who make you better and who challenge you and push you. So that's what I did. And, and I noticed with Stephen PowerShell, I couldn't follow everything that he was saying sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, he's he's at another level, up. man. But whenever I get stuck, he's the first person I go to. I'm like, Steve, I'm stuck. And, and he's, he's brilliant. So again, surround yourself with people with a common passion. And the passion of the league was just DevOps. Yeah. Right, and then that challenge you, and then push you to be the best version of yourself. Yeah, there was a lot of, for me, there was a lot of trust involved too. Right, there are people that you trust that that just have your back. You know that they can deliver software. When you're working on a software project, it can be really, really intense. The deadlines are hard, hours are crazy, the pressure is massive, and sometimes it. It's a little dramatic for me to say some, it feels like war sometimes, but sometimes it feels like you are fighting, right? And you need you need to have that trust. And that's one of the things I had with Donovan. I knew he would always have my back. I knew if he said something was, was gonna get done, he would get it done. I knew if I needed help doing whatever, he was he would always be there. And that type of trust, that carries on through everything, right? So So even today, I know if I need something and I need it done and it has to be like at a certain level, if I go to Donovan, without a doubt, it's going to happen, right? So that that type of trust is huge. So, so yeah, you have to build. Means, go ahead, go ahead Sebastian. Sorry, that, that means like in short words, you need to create a safe space for your team to be able to say what they really want to say. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's for a management perspective for sure. But I think the yeah. trust that Abel and I were talking about is just he's always shown up for me. I always say he's one of the best developers I've ever met. And whenever I work with Abel, as like we're both engineers on the same project, I know I have to bring my A game. Because Abel's going to make me look like an idiot, right? It's like he's going to embarrass me about how much code he's going to crank out. So what I do is I'm like, okay, I got to up my game. He makes everyone on the team better because I trust him to be the best, which drives me to be better. So that trust that we're talking about is that when I give you a project or give you an assignment or give you a module or a function or a class, whatever, I know that that thing's going to be nailed out perfectly. And that's the trust that I have with Abel. We had to do a Forrester review recently. And I brought Abel with me. I'm like, okay, man, I, I, there's no way I can do this on my own. But you bring the people that you trust, which is really important. So I did see a question in here, though. Uh, this yeah. is a good question, too. It's about what process, yeah. Yeah, what, what process template should you use uh, if you're a small team? And what I think is really powerful about Azure DevOps, VSTS, VSO, TFS, whatever it's been called, <laughs> it's always had multiple templates. Even on day one, it had CMMI, Scrum, and Agile templates that came right out of the box. And what I think is really powerful about that concept is that Agile and Scrum, they're extremely similar, right? The templates are extremely similar. What changes is the vocabulary, right? So instead of having an issue, you'll have an impediment, right? Instead of having a product backlog item, you have a user story. And the way that bugs are treated were slightly different. So I never looked at which template should I choose based on the size of my team. I chose what template I should use on the methodology that we want to follow. 
I've literally run a scrum team with one person on it. I was a scrum master. There was one individual. We did the daily stand up. We went through all the rituals just like anything else because what I wanted that person to learn before we integrated him into the bigger team was you got to know the rituals. You got to know the rules. So let's just do a really small project. We're going to do all the rituals like we normally would. We selected the exact same template the bigger team was using. I created a team project just for that one person. We put in all their tasks. We ran their backlogs. We ran their sprint reviews. We did everything. And then when they got, man, this is awesome. Like, yeah, now I'm going to put you over here on this bigger team. They're doing exactly the same thing that you've already been doing. So I wouldn't want a small team to use one template. And then you get integrated into a bigger team that's using a different template. And now they got to figure out, like, why do the words not match? Why do the reports not look quite the way that I want them to look? So when you're choosing the proper template, think about the process that you're following, the vocabulary that you use in your daily standups and all your rituals, and make sure you pick the template that is the closest match to that. Because what you don't want to do is in your daily standup, say impediment and product backlog item, and then go to your tool and it says issue and user story. Like, well, why, which one of these matches to what? And that's really nice that Team Foundation Server and all of its versions allow you to pick the template that matches the vocabulary that you use every day in your daily standup. So don't don't take your size of your team into consideration. Take the process and the methodology that you want to follow as your deciding factor on what template to choose. Anything to add, Abel? Pretty much said everything. You know, <laughs> to me, to me the, the templates, they used to matter a lot because based on the templates that you choose in TFS, back when it was called TFS, you would get different kinds of reports, right, from the uh, SQL Server reporting services. Um, you know, that emphasis has kind of, kind of shifted. So uh, I'm an agilist and I like, I love doing pure scrum. So I like using the scrum template, but I can run just about any agile process using any agile flavored template. Sure. So, yeah, it, it's, it's not really the, the size of your team that matters. Right. Now, there's another good question here. Uh, they would like to hear how we manage to change from a waterfall to an agile. Yeah. Team. That's, yeah. That is a powerful question. I'll let you go first, Abel. Uh, it was painful. It was long. <laughs> it always is. It always right. is for sure. Um, so it's funny because I've done talks that, are, that have spanned two hours on this subject all the way down to 30 minutes, right? Um, <clears throat> I think that the big thing is that we were not agile in any way, shape, or form, right? Every three to four years, we'd put out a new version of Windows, new version of TFS, Office, so on and so forth. Around the 2005-ish time frame, right, or maybe 2010, we started noticing that we were being out-innovated by our competitors because they were moving so much faster than us and we were losing market share. <clears throat> and our leadership was far seeing enough to say, this is something that has to change. And if we're going to change this, there's no magic wand that you can just wave and magically make it better, which means this is going to be painful, right? We had to change all sorts of things, how we were organized. We had to change how we architected our application. We had to change how our teams work together. Um, I'm not sure how I can distill this down into like five minutes. Do you know how to say this really quickly? Yeah, one of the things that I, I tell people to do is you have to let go of all the things that you used to know about ad, about uh, Waterfall, right? You're not going to have milestones. You're not going to have Gantt charts. You need to stop trying to customize Agile or Scrum back into the process that you were using before. A lot of people come into it with wanting to change as little as they have to about their current process and get a lot of gains, and that doesn't know how it works. The fact that you're investigating Agile or Scrum is because you know Waterfall is failing. So don't hold on to any of the relics that come from Waterfall. What you need to do is truly really go in there and say, I'm going to, we're going to start from scratch and we're going to get buy-in from every level of our organization. Your, your dev team can't be the only part of your organization that says we want to stop doing Waterfall because when you do that and you start saying words like sprints and backlogs and, and impediments to people who are expecting Gantt charts and milestones and change requests, you're going to have this complete disconnect and this mismatch of communication. And the people who don't get it, if they're above you, are going to have the leverage and power and influence to force you back into giving them Gantt charts and milestones that you don't want. So the highest success rate I've ever had at moving a company from a waterfall world into an agile world is when I had executive buy-in. So that when I had that middle management who didn't want to change the way that they were doing it, I said, well, I already have permission from your CEO to make like, we're, we're going to do daily standups. We're going to do uh, short iterations. We're going to do sprint reviews. We're going to do all that stuff we're going to do. Because convincing a developer to do it, that's easy. Like You just promise a developer that you're going to love doing what you're doing. I'm going to give you your nights and your weekends back. You're going to be delivering high-quality code. You're going to be doing it every two weeks. Like, they're like, dude, sign me up. Like I love all that. 
But when you say that to middle management, who's already who's used to all this progressive uh, ex estimating and then trying to figure out when they're going to ship stuff, it's really foreign for them. So what I found to be the most successful is educate everyone so that no one feels like an outsider. No one feels like they don't understand what's going on. They're all an integral part of this change that the organization is going on. And when you do that, everyone feels like, hey, man, let, let's make this work because all of our lives are going to be better if we actually succeed. And that's a fact, right? I, I, I've been doing Agile for, what, 14 years now? And I have yet to leave a team that was not ecstatic that I was there and was doing better after I left and transformed them from Waterfall to Agile than ever before. And after I leave, I'll get emails as far as a year later thanking me for coming to this company and saying, Donovan, we're still doing amazing. I, you've changed like everything about the way that we write software. And what was really important there, and one other advice I'll give you is make sure that you have a certified scrum master like a like a battle worn scrum master come in and help your company through this transformation because it will be very very painful and if you have someone who's trying to lead this transformation who's never done it before that you just sent them off and said hey go get certified and then come back and tell us what to do the things they come back to tell you what to do are so drastically different and they've never actually seen it work they've just told that it will work and so when they get pressure from the 30 year vet who says i'm not coming to your stupid daily stand up they don't feel like they have the authority to say, yes, you are. And they say, OK, fine, we just won't do the daily stand up then. But we're still going to work in iterations. And slowly their scrum deteriorates right back to what they've been doing for the last 30 years. And then you and then they all oh, scrum didn't work here. No, you never did scrum. Right. You immediately started changing it and removing parts of it so that you never actually did it. So what failed was something other than scrum. It was what you wanted to. You, it's almost like self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't want it to work and you don't follow the processes, of course you're gonna fail, and you're gonna be back to doing what it was before. So to get from Waterfall to Agile or Scrum is to go all in, get support from the outside, because when a consultant like myself comes in with the with the authority and power and leaning in and, and willing to tell anybody in that company that no, you are gonna do this, then all of a sudden people listen. I can leave six months from now and everyone will understand what it is that they're supposed to be doing. So it's a tough transition, get as much outside support as you can, buy in from the bottom to the top, and educate everyone like that would be my advice on getting from waterfall to agile i think it's really important that you said you need buy-in you need that it, it needs to start from the top all the way down to the bottom because so much has to change right yeah. that middle layer like you were saying they want their gantt charts they need certain metrics or they think they need certain metrics yeah. we all know those metrics that they have we've made those numbers up completely so they don't really mean anything so they need to have people even higher than them to say no these are not the old metrics are not what you need these are the agile metrics that actually make sense. These are what you need. This is what we can judge progress or productivity and things like that. Right. All right. I see tons of questions coming in, so okay. I'll let Sebastian start feeding okay. into this there's, because I know yeah. I've missed some of them. Actually, the actually, I go just just because there is one connected. There is a guy asking. There is a have ten teams of ten members, and they all went the whole DevOps thing, but they felt like there is now a gap between them and marketing and R and D, and so like. How is marketing involved? How do they can maybe be more agile? And then how can that work to close the gap between those teams? OK, so all right, so it's about getting everyone involved in your DevOps transformation. Yeah. So one of the things that I recommend is make sure that you're transparent. What I mean by transparent is your product backlog should be visible by your entire company. Your, your marketing team shouldn't have to send an email to Abel saying, so Abel, what are you guys working on? It should be like, here's a link to our backlog. Like it's in priority order, that's what we're working on. So if someone in marketing says, oh man, we have this big campaign coming that needs this feature that's way down here on the bottom, they can then go have a communication with the product owner and say, hey, I really need you to reprioritize this or this is why this is important. And they can have that negotiation with the product owner because the product owner is the only person who has the authority to move any of the items on the product backlog. Now, everyone who sees the product backlog can go and try and influence the product owner to make a decision that benefits them or whatever or have that negotiation but being transparent and allowing them to see what you're working on your daily stand-ups should not be hidden anyone and everyone should be able to come to your daily stand-up and listen to that daily stand-up they're not allowed to like to interrupt you they're not allowed to make a 15 minute an hour long they need to understand the rules you're allowed to come you're allowed to listen and afterwards you can ask the scrum master whatever you want but you do not derail that conversation but it is transparent same thing with your product backlog, same thing with your sprint backlog. So the marketing team can see what you're working on and influence your decisions on what you should or should not be working on. 
Another thing that I would do is in your planning meetings, this is an amazing opportunity for you to bring in all different people from your organization. Marketing should be there and infrastructure should be there. Quality assurance should be there. Anyone who's going to have a vested interest or a hand in getting that software from idea into running in production should be in your planning meeting because you need to plan on the infrastructure being there. You need to plan on the integration tests being run. You need to plan on the performance tests being run. So many times they say, when are you gonna be done? And we're only looking at the developer. Like when is the developer gonna think that their code complete? That's not when I can ship that software. I can't ship the software till it's tested. I can't ship the software till the infrastructure that it's gonna run and has been provisioned inside of our, our, our cloud or our infrastructure. So why are we waiting to talk to those people about when we're gonna be done. They should be in the planning meeting. And when I started doing that, our estimates became so much better because you're not done until it's ready to ship. And what we realized is that we wanted to be ready to ship as you should through the Agile Manifesto at the end of every sprint. That means testing had to be done in the sprint. You don't have a sprint where you write it and then another sprint where you test it and another sprint where you deploy it. That's not it. You're just basically doing waterfall again. What you wanna do is get a actual feature an actual portion of your software from idea to tested and ready to ship by the end of your sprint. And what we would try to do in our old company where we were shipping software was like, we wanna be able to say, okay, product owner, you just saw the software. There's an approval email inside of your inbox. If you liked what you saw, you click approve and that code will go into production right now. That's how done your software needs to be at the end of every sprint. And the only way we get there is to have marketing, QA, infrastructure, database, like everyone has to be involved in your planning so that when you actually bite off to chew for that sprint can actually be done, done to your definition of done. So it's really important, be transparent, involve everyone in your planning meetings. And I think you're gonna to start to break down a lot of those barriers and silos you have in your company. That's a great yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. You want to say anything or should I ship the next question to you, Abel? <laughs> sure, next question. Okay, there is a question from Yannick Fellion. Hey, hello, Yannick, I know you. <laughs> uh, what do you think is the better way of for Go for CI CD? Is it Azure Pipelines or GitHub? What's the different approach or is it actually the same? <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for this one. That is a great question. Um, so I am, I am a big fan of actions. They're very clean. Uh, they work really well. I think actions for CI is fantastic. I think today, what day is today's date? It is uh, 8.13, right? It's uh, the 13th. Today on the 13th, I don't think actions is ready for true CD, right? Especially for enterprise continuous delivery. They're missing some features I really like, like approval gates and things like that. So because of that, I would use pipelines for my deployments. Yeah, and, and what I technology. Yeah, what I tell a lot of people when I'm having this GitHub versus Azure DevOps is there's no wrong answer. That's mm -hmm. the first answer. Like you can choose whichever one works for you. And that's what you should do. If your code is already sitting inside of GitHub and what you need is to deploy an Azure static web app, guess what? GitHub Actions comes out of the box ready to rock and roll. Why, why would you not use that Azure option? If you want to deploy to a VM in a scale set inside of Azure DevOps and make sure you have zero downtime, GitHub Actions is not going to do that for you. <laughs> right, but Azure DevOps will, right? Mm -hmm. So what you need, so all we've done by acquiring GitHub and adding GitHub Actions is giving you another tool in your toolbox, right? So open up your toolbox, look at the problem that you're trying to solve and see if it can be solved with GitHub Actions or it can be solved with Azure DevOps, but there's no wrong answer, right? So I've used them both. I tend to lean towards Azure DevOps because I'm familiar with it, I'm comfortable with it and I get it to do literally anything I can want it to do, I can make it do in my sleep because I've been working with the product since it was invented, right? So I have a tendency to stay over there and there's no end of support announced. There's like, there's that you can use it to your heart's content and we're going to be there to support you with it. So the, the short answer is there's no wrong answer. Find the tool that works best for you. Use that tool and Microsoft's going to support you either way. Great question, but I knew that question, that question had to come up. <laughs> there's, there's no way we talk about it and that, that question doesn't come up. There is a system. Yeah, so there is there's actually a deep question. He asked, uh, Paul asks about like basically the, the token, the system dot access token that you get to use in the pipelines. He's actually saying he thinks like that he's always the user of every pipeline. He feels like that is a kind of super user. Is it a, a possibility to generate such a, or use such an access token with different users so that you're separated by project or anything like this? 
So the the access token that's provided to you if you check the box saying give my task access to the access token are only that's scoped to the project that you're in. It's actually not a super user, so it's like you can't jump and use stuff inside of another project. Like it's it's scoped to the project that you're actually in. Now, if you want to have access to other projects or scope access to individuals, what you can do is just create an access token, right? And when you create an access or personal access token, you can then scope it to whatever parts that you want, whatever accounts that you want, whatever actions that you want, and then use those access tokens in the appropriate builds to give only the access that you want. But even when you say, hey, I want access to that, I was playing with it recently with VST, which is a PowerShell module that Sebastian and I work on together. And one of the things I did is I put it inside, I used it as the authentication for my bear token of my VS team rest call. And I was trying to do stuff in another project and it kept failing saying this person doesn't have access to that project. I'm like, oh wow, that thing is scoped just to the project that, I, that this pipeline is actually in. And for me to go outside of that project and do stuff against other projects, I had to then go get, I created my own personal access token said I want this one to have rights to all of my stuff. And I use that as my authentication versus the actual token that's provided for me. And then I could go off and do stuff outside of it. So it's not actually a super user. It's actually scoped already to the project that you're in. But if you need to scope it further, just go create an access token yourself and use that as your authentication versus the, the path that comes across. Uh, you could even like with yeah. GitHub and pull request, it can even limit the pull request. The, the you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do that with conditions and stuff. Like I only want you to do this if it is a pull request or, or, or if it's only emerging to master. We do that as well, right? So there's certain yeah. parts of our pipeline that only run if it's actually being merged into master, but all of our pull requests stop there. Like, okay, this is a PR. I tested everything, but I'm not going to try to go into production because you haven't merged it into master yet. So there's conditions you can add to your pipelines that give you lots of flexibility as well. Yeah, um, there is a question from Savi or Sivai. Um, they have like they want to transform around 50 teams with repos to Git in a single trunk strategy. Um, they'd like to use a feature toggling, I think a feature framework with a decent uh, software as a service platform out there. Is anything that you can recommend? Abel's our feature flag guy, so I'm going to let you. I have a couple ideas, but I'm sure Abel has a better answer. Yeah. So what the question is, do I have a suggestion on a feature flag product? Yeah, like like uh, um, I can, he said like a feature toggling with a decent uh, SaaS platform. I'm yeah. not sure if he talks about the DevOps platform or a platform that uh, supports you with feature flags. I'm not sure if he means. There's a, there's a couple suggestions that I would use. Um, I've used LaunchDarkly a lot in the past and they work phenomenally well. There's also feature flagging built into Azure now. That works to me surprisingly well because I didn't even realize it was there until maybe about two months ago. I don't even know how long it's been there, but I finally figured it out. Right, um, but there is there's a you can create a, an application configuration resource inside of Azure, and there you can create your toggles. You can have features, um, you can have feature switches, you can even have uh, conditional toggles where you can send percentages of your traffic into whether the toggle is on or off and things like that as well. So it's very fully featured. I What I really like about that is you can absolutely control it all using the Azure CLI, which means I can start adding feature toggling on and off or even changing my percentages within my pipeline itself. And then that starts becoming super exciting and super powerful. Yeah. So yeah, those, those are the two options I would have said as well. Uh, app config inside of Azure if you're in Azure and you want to use it. And I don't even know if you have to be in Azure. No, you don't uh, have to be in yeah, Azure. Yeah, you can actually be outside of Azure and still use those toggles or launch Darkly, which was a, is a great partner of ours that we've been using for a long time as well. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah Frederick Small, he asks, um, how would you go about deploying microservices in CI CD pipelines? Would you recommend a deploy based on Teams or more along the lines of resources, especially in the case of shared resources? That's a, that's a good one. Now we we do a lot of this inside of the Azure DevOps team, and unfortunately, I'm going to give you the the normal uh, consultant answer. It depends uh, <laughs> on on the architecture of your application. Uh, a lot of us are doing a lot of things where we're making sure that we can deploy our microservices independently, which means they need to be backwards and forwards compatible. Which means that if that shared resource hasn't been updated to the level that I need to, I need to be able to run successfully on that old version of that resource. And then when that resource is Re revision or upgraded to where I need it to be, I need to be able to start taking advantage of that. So if you couple feature flags, what we just talked about, 
with your microservices, you can turn on and turn off that extra functionality when you know that that shared resource has actually been updated or not, right? Uh, some people are not only doing a mono repo, but even though they're microservices, they're deploying their solution as a unit, right? Which, which means you know everything's going to be deployed, but that sometimes defeats the purpose. The whole point of doing microservices for some teams is to be able to deploy myself at any cadence that I want. But you got to be careful that if you're upgrading yourself like crazy, that you're not leaving a, just a wake of destruction behind you because you're breaking contracts and your signatures don't match anymore and then your dependence upon you no longer work. So you now have, you carry a little bit of technical debt sometimes because you have to keep those APIs around long enough till you know that they're no longer needed by anyone in your ecosystem before you can go back in and clean that stuff up. And we're dealing with that with the Azure DevOps team. I made it, there's a show you can actually watch on how we actually do versioning of our microservices on the Azure DevOps team called uh, DevOps Interviews. Just look for the one that has uh, TQ in it. And he and I are talking about that. And I, he made a comment that, we use telemetry that lets us know what version of our APIs people are accessing. And once we see for a period of time, no one accesses a particular version of that API, it becomes a candidate to be removed from the API so that we can start to clean up some technical debt. And then I made the jokes is, you mean I can run a batch file every day that calls version one of your API and you'll never delete it? He said, yep. Like it's like, but so there's, there's clever, you have to figure out how are you going to do this? How are you going to pop propagate to everyone that this API is going to get sunset or deprecated so that they know that they need to start upgrading to the other version. So to answer your question, it actually does depend uh, on your solution. And there's not a silver bullet one size fits all when it comes to deploying or even developing microservices. It really depends on what you're doing. If you're like, for example, a lot of us are teasing apart monoliths. <laughs> right, when you're teasing apart a monolith, that monolith has to go first, right? I mean, and that's still a monolith. And that microservice might be able to rev a little faster, but for you to take advantage of this microservice's newer version, the whole monolith has to be deployed with the parts who need to use that new part, right? So it just depends on if you're starting from scratch with all microservices architecture, you can be a lot more flexible and a lot more individual re individual microservices go at their own pace because we all have an agreed contract. But if you're teasing apart a monolith, then all of a sudden there's some dependencies there that you're simply going to be difficult for you to break. Yeah. Cool. The, the question yeah. I wanted was how do you deal with hero developers that <laughs> yeah. make themselves look great and say, uh, again, that's a really good, good role for an external scrum master to come in, right? Because we don't need any brilliant assholes on our team. Uh, and we've all dealt with those people before and it's dangerous. Another thing that I try to do for almost 20 years. <laughs> 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 I know, I know, hey, boy, you're horrible. All right, whatever. So one of the things is, is that what you want to be able to do is figure out a way to, it's kind of a weird way of saying this, but you, you, you want to take away some of that power by automating what would make them indispensable. But we don't want to lower their importance, right? It's the same thing when you look at infrastructure, when you're moving from a, to a DevOps mindset with an infrastructure team, we all know that one person on the infrastructure team who has that thumb drive that has all the scripts on it, right? And if this thumb drive were to ever be lost, the keys to the kingdom would be lost. It almost glows when you hold it because you know how powerful this one thumb drive is. Whoever holds that thumb drive is the king. That's a problem for your organization. Those scripts should be in source control. Preferably, I'd input in infrastructure's code files such that they can be run automatically as part of your pipeline and you get the desired end result. When one person holds all that power, they become that hero. They become the center of gravity. They become that person who tries to make themselves like job security. That's not good for any team, right? They should be thinking more like a team and less like an individual. So again, if they've been there the longest, it's hard for you as the new person to say, you know, we really should be storing that stuff in source control. We should really be doing infrastructure code. But if you hire me as the scrum master from outside as a consultant, I come in and I have been given that authority by the people who are paying me to be there. And then I can go back and say, no, we're not going to have that thumb drive anymore. We're going to switch over the infrastructure code, and that's going to be version in source control, right? So it's hard for you to have that conversation sometimes with your peers. So I, some of the best advice I give anyone who's on this digital transformation is hire a scrum master. Hire someone who's done this already, who has been given the authority to go make these really hard decisions and say no to people who have never been said no to before. And it's, it's really a powerful uh, enabler for your DevOps and digital transformation for sure. A lot of times these hero developers, they, you end up getting them because they're the only people that understand a certain area of code or whatever. So I think it's super important to kind of break up that monopoly and have more people understand what that is. And 
you know, the onus is on to, I guess, the scrum master or whoever's running the team to be like, no, you're not the only person that knows. You're going to pair with somebody so that more people on the team can actually learn and figure these things out. I think one of the most interesting things that happened on the Azure DevOps team for the developers, um, you all have heard the story, right, where if there's a live site incident, it just turns into it's, it's a horrible, there are two people on support that actually have to support that. They have to get on the call bridge. They're not allowed off that bridge until they slap a Band-Aid on the problem to fix it. And they're still not allowed off that bridge until they figured out the root cause and then come up with a plan to fix it, right? So to be on that call bridge is absolutely horrible. But if you are a brand new person entering into that team, the very first thing they do to you is they throw you on that support team because there's no faster way to learn the code than through fire, which sounds insane, but it's true. So whoever has that monopoly, yeah, someone else just you, someone else just needs to go in there, brave the fire, be for, forged out of fire, right? And you'll come out and if there are more developers that know the stuff, no more heroes. And the, another way to do that, uh, Abel, is that mm -hmm. a team should be self-managing. Yeah. When you see a task on a task task board that says go write a database stored procedure and you've never done one before, go grab that task. Go try to learn how to write a stored procedure. Yeah. Move that task forward because if no one is working on that task right now, that means the database expert is probably off fighting another database thing. There's no reason you can't be trying to learn how to move that forward. Help the team and you're you're increase, improving your knowledge of mm -hmm. what stored procedures are. You're doing some research and then all of a sudden you're going to be able to help and move the the whole team is going to move faster when more people get out of their comfort zone and start pulling tasks that they wouldn't normally ta uh, pull. Writing a manual test, anyone on your team can write a manual test. Running a manual test, learning how to write unit tests, like go grab those tasks you didn't grab yesterday and try to learn how to do them so that tomorrow you're a better, uh, better teammate for everyone. And that starts to break down again, that superhero where we're all waiting for Able to do the five most important tasks and all we're doing around is waiting. That's not good for the entire team. Yeah, it's not good cool. for Able because it's a lot of stress and pressure on him to be that superhero. Mm -hmm. And then when he fails, if he does fail, then that's bad for the entire team, right? So. Those, those superhero developers need to understand that they're not helping the team by hoarding all that information. And sometimes that's easier to be heard from an outsider. Yeah, actually, now it's a two questions for you personal more. One for Abel, when do you start to play guitar again? You have four nice guitars there. And for Donovan, it's actually, what's the best, most realistic online air hockey, air hockey game? <laughs> <laughs> I used to play one on my on my iPhone. I haven't played a fake one in a while. I have a real table here in the house, so uh, whenever I need to get some practice in, my wife's also world ranked as well, so she and I practice uh, every once in a while. But that's a good. I'll have to find one. I'll tweet one. I'll, I'll look for a good air hockey game on the iPhone, and, and I'll tweet one for sure. But Abel has a lot more than four guitars back there. Maybe that's all you can see in your <laughs> of guitars back there. I, I yeah. may have a couple more guitars than that. Uh, when will I play live again? Um, I don't know. Ignite's coming up pretty soon, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. maybe. I, I mean, know. you're remote. You have Twitter, so you still have the old Twitter video pinned on your, on your account. Which yeah, is that's, that's three years old. So that's ridiculous. Cool. One of the other questions I saw here, which is kind of interesting, is what do you think will be the most significant change in DevOps in the next five years? What I, I mean, let me tell you what I hope happens with DevOps in the next five years. I hope DevOps goes the way of continuous integration. If you're as old as I am. You remember when continuous integration was bleeding edge. You remember when that was like only the smartest people on your team got to go build your CI server and they had to use make files and it was a big <laughs> powerful machine and it's like this crazy source control system and pulling it all down and an ant file and stuff yeah. like that. It was just, it yeah. was a nightmare, right? It was really complicated. But now setting up CI is like checking a checkbox. You check a checkbox and now you have continuous integration set up. I hope DevOps goes that way. I hope DevOps gets so easy that in five years, you're not talking to me about DevOps anymore. You're talking to, to me about whatever came after DevOps, right? Whatever enabled, whatever DevOps enables us to do, that's where we should be focusing because DevOps is just a checkbox now. Just like if you look at static web apps is a really good example. When you create a static web app, you get the pipeline for free, right? And if you go into Azure DevOps, <laughs> and either Azure DevOps has great templates now that are making it almost an afterthought. If you go into the Azure portal, depending on what resource you choose, you can simply say, set up continuous delivery for me, and it just happens. So what I'm hoping five years from now is that DevOps just becomes a thing of the past that we're not focusing on anymore. Because I cannot tell you the last time someone said, can you come talk to us for an hour about CI? <laughs> like, never. Like, like, that doesn't happen because it's no longer that big of a deal anymore. 
It's, it's kind of like what's happening with Git right now. I remember you could have an entire 75 minute session just on Git because Git was taking over the world. We were transitioning to it. No one understood what a branch was or a fork was or when do should I rebase when I should not rebase. But now, like most of us don't even concern ourselves with that stuff. It's just the way that we do our job. DevOps is taking a little bit longer because there's so much you can do in a pipeline. And it, it seems like there's always something else. You can add security, you can add performance scanning, you can add uh, like bots to do your scanning for you. Like there's so much value you can add, but hopefully it comes to the point to where that value isn't something I have to add. It's just in the pipeline already. And if I'm running it through this pipeline, I'm getting the security checks, I'm getting the performance scans, I'm getting the pen test done automatically. And it's just about moving our code as fast as possible. So my hope is that in five years, obviously we were talking about it now. What do you think is going to happen, Abel? We're getting closer, right? Uh, so I, I just saw this feature inside of Visual Studio itself. Remember, Damian always says, friends don't let friends right click and publish, right? There's a feature in VS right now, Visual Studio, and it's in, in preview. You can like flip the toggles and actually see it. You can right click, and instead of like right clicking and publishing, what it does is it will create for you an action in GitHub where it will just fire off and build your application and deploy your app into Azure. And that to me is spectacular, right? Is it right click and publish? Well, you right click and it does publish, but it creates for you a real pipeline where it runs your unit test, where you can add security stuff to it, where you can make it grow if you need to. But that's super exciting for me. I don't want to sit there forever in YAML starting from scratch and slowly piecing together a massive pipeline anymore. It, you're right, it's getting easier and easier. Yeah, we hope it does. Uh, I saw a question here that we kind of skipped over. It says, uh, do you have any advice for large organizations heavily in, invested in Azure DevOps and Azure pipelines when it comes to the excitement around GitHub and Actions? It's challenging to support many teams that want to use many tools. Uh, I totally understand the challenge. Like Consolidation of your tool chain makes life a lot easier. Uh, but I go back to what I said earlier. You don't also want to force someone to use the wrong tool. Right. So if, if the if the right tool is GitHub Actions for the project that they're working on, there's there's need to be some flexibility there to let them use the right tool. Um, if I have a screw and a hammer, I could probably drive that screw if I hit <laughs> with a hammer hard enough. But I'd be much better using a screwdriver, right? The proper tool for the proper job. And depending on what resources you're targeting in Azure, like again, I think static web apps is a really good example. The best way to do that today is actions, right? Because for you to do it with GitHub. Uh, with Azure DevOps, you'd have to go roll that solution yourself because it do, we don't even have a task that does that right now. So not that we couldn't do that, and it's definitely flexible enough for you to do that. And if you're already invested with the rest of your pipeline as an Azure DevOps, I might go make that investment because I don't want to have part of my solution deployed with one pipeline in a completely different product, and then another part of my solution or the majority of it actually deployed in another pipeline. That to me feels painful. But if we're talking greenfield, brand new, no dependencies, I would let them choose the tool that they think is going to make them the most efficient because that's my goal is to continuously deliver value. Anything that gets in the way of continuously delivering value, that needs to be evaluated and removed as fast as possible. So I, I hate I hate these it depends answers, but of course I'm a big fan of consolidating your tool chain because the less tools I have to manage, the easier my life becomes. But I also am, and I am a proponent of use the best tool for the job. And we are now giving you more and more tools from Microsoft to allow you to solve the problem. So I wish I had a more, this is exactly what you do. But in, situ in situations like this, it, it's not a, a black and white answer. It's a damn, that, that's a tough question because the answer is not always just black and white. But I think you're, there's, like I said before, there's no wrong choice. Actions in GitHub, GitHub Actions and Azure DevOps both come from Microsoft. Right, regardless of what you're seeing from marketing, they're separate companies, they're both separate companies, but like we have your back at Microsoft to support you either way that you go. Uh, so I think if it's a if it's a greenfield application, let them choose it between the two. If it's a brownfield application, I'd probably snap to the one that you've already been using for the majority of that particular product. Yeah, I'll have to sign your I'll, I'll sign your service book again next time we see each other for sure. <laughs> my my wife has a picture of me when I was signing that. It's pretty cool. She had a picture of me over my shoulder. I, I was thinking about that story the other day because when you asked me to do that, I was so nervous. You might remember I actually autographed like a piece of paper next to me a couple of times to make sure that it was I wasn't going to screw up on your device, which is just crazy. So yeah, that's still a, a still a highlight of my trip to Germany, man. Thanks so much for that. 
Um, there is actually a more, uh, I think, a migration question about the Azure DevOps migration to it. Do you think they will fine grain or add features so you can actually have one collection on premise and split it into two organizations or something like that? Um, without there's, adding, uh, without yeah, there's, a, there's a partner of Microsoft's that um, my wife's a writer for them and Practic, I believe, is the name of the, of the consulting firm. They have a tool that does this already. Right, so they have a migration service that they provide that they've written that actually will let you split and dice and slice and dice your migrations the way that you want to. Ours right now is a wholesale move, right? You're basically lifting your own prem TFS and you're moving it into the cloud as an organization. If you want to be able to split and move them, what you're going to have to do is do that on prem before you move your resource, right? So, because if you remember, the admin tools allow you to combine and remove and dissect collection. So you can say, I want to put all these projects in one collection. So you want to do whatever manipulation of the collections before you start your migration, right? So, but I think the question is slightly different. It says, I want versus all at once. Yeah, so what you'd have to do there is you'd have to separate your collections on-prem and, and slice and dice in the way that you need them. And then once you have them the way that you want, run your migration against them. Now, the part that I don't know that you'll be able to do with the migration tool is once you're ready to move two or three other ones, I'm not sure how quite that's going to work. What I've been do doing with some of our, our customers is talking to them about uh, two other partners, Ops Hub and TaskTop are two other partners that we have that are fantastic for synchronizing and migrating particular type of data from any two uh, systems that you want, including TFS on-prem and inside of Azure DevOps. So I would look at Practix tool, uh, which I know can do a lot of what you just described, or I would look at Ops Hub or TaskTop, our partners, because our migration tool today, it's a good tool, but it's pretty much saying you're going to move all of it uh, and it's going to be one one shot move for you. Yeah, um, maybe it's a good, could be a good question for Abel. There he is, uh, live at Kirk.one is asking also, uh, they have a, like a company with 10 developers working on several projects and they didn't have a good experience with doing the full scrum thing. Uh, do you have any experience you can share about that problem? So 10 developers, they did Scrum, did not have a good experience with Scrum. I think the first thing I would start doing is asking what happened, right? Why did it not work out well? And usually, I almost want to say always, it's because they're not really doing Scrum or they're not doing Scrum correctly. Because Scrum done correctly is like a fine-tuned machine. It just it works beautifully. But a lot of times when I start talking to people, and I've been doing process consulting for a really long time before I joined Microsoft, most people jump into Scrum, and the first thing they want to do is they want to customize it for their company. And I always tell them, wait, before you customize or change how you do the Scrum process, get a book that tells you exactly how to do Scrum and do it straight from the book for at least a couple of iterations. Because at the end of maybe two, three, four iterations, you might be able to legitimately say, okay, this was all right, but it might be better if we tweaked it like that. I'm okay with that. But if you start customizing the process before you've even tried it out of the box, you have no idea what should be tweaked, what shouldn't. So try it out of the box first. And the other thing that's super important is you need a Scrum Master that really understands the Scrum process so they can teach and lead the team into doing it correctly. Because I guarantee you, as a dev team, doing Scrum correctly is a beautiful thing. One thing that I noticed that in that question, though, it says they worked on several projects at a time. I think that's... Oh. that's yeah, that, that changes a lot, right? Because that changes everything. I, I don't think you can actually... A, a developer, I think, can be on two Scrum teams is the maximum. If a developer is on more than two Scrum teams, it's a waste of time because they're context switching. They're in three daily standups, three planning meetings, three retrospectives, three sprint reviews. It's just they, there's no time for them to actually work, right? So I've never had a developer on more than two Scrum teams ever, right? Because when I've tried to do it and I've tried to be that person thinking I'm the that hero developer we we're talking about, I could be on 10 Scrum teams. No, you can't, no. right? It simply does not work out. So. One of the things that I would do is limit the number of teams an individual is on to no more than two, right? Honestly, and if can, I don't even like being on two. Like it's, it's tough. The it's amount tough. of context switching that you have to do is, yeah, it's really rough. Yeah, and but I think that that was the part of the question. That, you're right. That's the part that I missed because that changes yeah. everything. Yeah. Actually, Kirk was ah oh, Kirk didn't raise the hand again. I thought he wants to have a follow up to that topic, but okay. Yeah. Of um, course. Oh, yeah. You, you, yeah. Hello, it's me, Kirk. Um, you got my question right, uh, Donovan. Uh, the problem was uh, we have too many projects, too many small projects that have to be delivered in a small amount of time. 
and we have uh, tried to do it in, in uh, 13 day sprints or three week sprints and it's less work for three weeks so we can can do um, a complete sprint for for each project and so this is where our problem started yeah what, what i would have challenged if i were the scrum master that came in there i would have said one of these like some of these projects can't be done right now like there has to be a priority like all like let's say for example you had 10 people on five scrum teams like four of these aren't as important as the other one. Like, like we need to figure out which one of these needs to go first. Let's get that project done. Let's succeed at Scrum. Let's get them successful. And then we're going to go off and build another team. If these four projects are all that important, go get me four more freaking Scrum teams. Mm -hmm. Like what we don't do is split this per team apart and have them doing a third of their day on every one of these things because you're really not you're not getting the benefits of scrum you're not getting that muscle memory out of it so again splitting developers is hard and the way that i get away from that is i simply say okay let's be realistic here all this stuff isn't priority one one of these projects has to wait for us to get this project done and then we'll move on to the next project that you want us to do the sad truth is right if you if you if i'm in three projects or three scrum teams is they're not going to get a third a third a third of my productivity because all of that context switching you're going to get a lot less Right? And, and it's, it's it diminishing returns. The more teams you throw me on, the less amount of work I can get done for each team. Yep. Like you're saying, anything more than two. It's too much. It's in, too my, much. It's just in my professional opinion, it's way too much. Mm -hmm. It's just a context switch. So I'm gonna, we only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to try to kick some of these. I, I found one that I know I can answer real quick. So what do you do? What do you recommend for database versions and update safety? Uh, there's, yeah, go, go ahead, Abel, because I know yeah. Abel. So go ahead. Because I do this all the time. I have this talk all the time. Um, database versioning, uh, you have to store your versions, it, it, your changes in source control, right? Are they asking about no downtime? What was the question? No, the question is, what do you recommend to manage DB versions and update safely? So ah, this okay. is about like, like Red Gates Ready Roll, uh, Red Liquid Gates, Gates Flyway, uh, SSDT, like there's so many projects out there now that actually will do exactly what you just said. They, yep. they take your actual database schema, they store it in source control right next to everything else. And then they have processes and tasks that will deploy it for you inside of your pipeline, right? So uh, one last thing I would say about deploying safely, deploy often, which means have a dev environment with a database schema that looks just like production. Have a QA environment that has a database schema that looks just like production. Mm -hmm. Practice the actual updates and the migrations. You want to know that it's going to fail well before you get to production that it either is or is not going to work based on what you've had. But I'm a big fan of SSDT. I, I've loved it. I've had great success with it. Abel, <laughs> he I'm likes. A, I'm a big fan of Redgate. And I'll tell you why, right? Because Redgate lets you do it in both ways, right? You can have state-based and you can also have like the version. Migrations, uh, migration based. Based. Yeah, and yeah. you can also do entity framework, code first migrations. Like there's no limit. And I, I remember that question used to be a lot harder to answer when yeah. there was like no answer to it, right? It's like, oh, I don't know how you do that. But now we like it's in. I'll say it again slower. Flyway, Liquibase, Redgate, uh, SSDT, which is SQL Server Data Tools, which is free, by the way, and Entity First, Code First Migrations. All of that can be integrated inside of your pipeline as part of your deployment and tested in your dev QA and prod environments before you actually worry about anything breaking up. So that's a fantastic question. Your yeah. database should be a part of your pipeline. Mm -hmm. like your database should not 100%. be something that you do in a little secret hunched over, oh, I'm going to go run this little script. No, it should be a part of your pipeline in source control. Fantastic question. Uh, what else do we Yeah, there is uh, Han Michael. Hi, Michael Han. He asked about, like, uh, is there something similar, like, in GitHub deploy keys for Azure DevOps? They want to make sure that for the PAT token for machine-to-machine -machine communication isn't invalidated to the corresponding uh -huh. users, at uh, least the company. Um, is there anything that you can recommend or a solution for that? Sounds like Abel has something. No, I was just thinking I've run into this problem before and I, I haven't figured anything out because I, I use PATs, right? But they're right. It, that's tied to a user. If the user leaves the company. Well, you can actually have your, that's a good point, Abel. Um, but you can actually have your PAT centrally managed by someone. Uh, mm -hmm. It would slow down the process a little bit because you'd have to request a PAT. Um, but nothing stops you from creating your own packs. I don't know if there's a feature that like, I don't know if there's a permission that says don't let this person create packs, right? Uh, but then you can revoke the pat whenever you want it to. Um, okay, that's a good one. Like, we might have to get back to you on that one. So to follow us on Twitter, uh, and one of us is probably going to blog that. And if you don't see a blog from us in the next week or two, remind yeah. us on Twitter. And, mm -hmm. and we'll go, we'll add someone to the conversation that can help us answer that for you. Is there anything else that we've missed in the last five minutes? Um, there is, I think there are some, some answers to each other, but there is a Great. question 
question. Uh, how do you see the move for Scrum to get moved from a process more to work as a framework? I'm not sure if you get this. Um, no, not really, because it's a process. It's it is a process, it's right? A process. Now there there are process templates that will help you do it correctly, but. Um, yeah, if you if you want to come off mute, uh, Martin, and, and ask that question again, because I'm not quite sure I follow it. Uh, but Scrum, Agile, Kanban, Waterfall, Rup, uh, Evolutionary Prototyping, these are all software development life cycles, right? These are all processes that you use to develop software. So I'm not sure what you mean, the difference between a process and a framework. Yeah, um, um, Je um, Jeffrey, a few months uh, before, uh, before this uh, discussed in the Azure DevOps podcast, um, the move from using Scrum as a, as a methodology, as a, as a process, and the uh, revision of the Scrum methodology um, to be uh, set up more like a framework instead of a process of, uh, and methodology. So I, I, I read about this and compared it to what's written in the Agile manifest, and I now try to figure out if, if this uh, uh, really will be released as a move from the former process, um, um, uh, um, more, more to a framework, framework. So what what do you think about that move and how would you suggest to move with this newer version of Scrum to implement it to your customers? All right, yeah, I, I'd have to probably won't be able to answer that one on here, but we're going to have to do a follow up for it. So yeah, if you can get us a little bit more details on that question, then we can go follow up uh, and see if we can get you an answer on that. And unfortunately, right now, I, I don't have an answer for that one. OK, thank you. No, no problem. Yeah. But definitely ping us on Twitter. Like, don't don't let us not answer that question for you. Like, like stay on us. We'll, we'll get you an answer. Yeah. Next time I get you a signature, we'll come back with us. <laughs> OK, OK, <laughs> sounds good. Okay, there is actually a short question, also Kirk again. Will there be something like to transfer a pet to another user? For example, use for a build manager in the project and they have to transfer work and new colleagues? Do you no, think that I, is even valuable? Yeah, what I would do in a situation like that is probably store those pets in something like Key Vault, right? I would take it out of my process. That way I can roll that pet in Key Vault and my pipeline will continue to work. Even if that person who owns that pipeline were to leave the company, but the pipeline still works and needs a new pat, if I'd actually stored it inside of uh, key, key Vault, I could just put a new version of that, and the pipeline will still pull the right key, just a new version, which would be the latest pat. So start looking at the Key Vault, because Key Vault really has a cool way of you saying, that is the secret that I want, and I want the latest version of that secret, and I'll just keep putting new pats in there whenever I need them, and none of my pipelines have to change because they're still going to the exact same Key Vault, still asking for the exact same key. They're just getting a newer version every time that they actually call it. So this is three minutes. Maybe I use. Maybe I still for one question. That's like Sanil asking for how do you go about spinning up test environments for different products teams? I mean, they have the monolithic application they set, and production feels always easy because it's singular. But how do you deal with that? That developers usually all want to have their own environment to test their own code before they commit it and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Infrastructure as code. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Abel. That's the answer. Go ahead. If you use infrastructure as code, so you define exactly what your infrastructure is, either using ARM templates, Terraform, so on and so forth, right? there's a whole bunch of technologies you can use. It's perfect. So as a dev, that's part of my pipeline. I check the code in, it will deploy, it'll configure, it'll provision the infrastructure that it needs for me up in Azure. I'll go ahead and deploy my application in there, all part of the pipeline, test it, make sure it looks good. And when it's done, it can just tear everything down. Infrastructure yeah. as code is awesome. Yeah, you can, you can create, and, and also, uh, Docker would be another one too, because you can yeah. actually provision yeah. an entire environment using Docker for Windows or Docker for Mac on your machine. Sebastian did some really cool stuff for VS Team to where all the unit tests are run in Docker containers on your local development environment. So you can test Linux and Windows and different versions of PowerShell. So like that's another way of thinking about it is I need to replicate this entire environment. I can either do it with infrastructure's code in our cloud provider and connect to it and do my development, or I can just spin it up in Docker containers locally and probably have an even faster and more proficient, uh, efficient interloop, uh, but there's several options of being able to do that. And the last question, there's actually a timeline you can, it says, is the universal feed anywhere soon in the Azure DevOps server too? There is a actual feature timeline that'll show you when all that stuff is actually coming and to what services, but off the top of my head, I don't know it. But what I will do, even after I have to drop in one minute, is I'm going to paste in here the actual URL to the timeline so that you can see what all the features are coming for that particular 
Uh, I just want to say thanks everyone for hanging out with us. Like I really Thank love you for yeah, these AMAs because yeah, so I think you get better questions answered than me coming up here and presenting for an hour on what I think you want to hear. Now you get to get oh, the answers that you the want. The win-win. They have personal questions and you don't need to prepare much. Just <laughs> exactly. Experience. Yeah, it, it's it's fantastic, man. So thank you so much, everyone, thank for having us. Much. And uh, choose. Yep. Thank you all. Cheers. <laughs> See you next time. And right. thank you for everybody for coming and have a good day and good evening. Take care.